Hello again and welcome back to our video training series on power system protection. Even if the protective relays, breakers, CTs, VTs, and communication equipment all seem to work exactly as planned, our job is not complete. We still need to investigate each disturbance after the fact. But why is it necessary to go back and analyze faults after they happen? Well, this is done for two basic reasons. First, to check that the relays and breakers are operating as intended. And second, to explain any misoperations and predict any future problems. Protective relays and breakers operate extremely fast. They can clear a fault in just a fraction of a second. Unless we can capture fault data and reconstruct what happened during that very short time frame, we would probably never be able to pinpoint the cause of relay or breaker misoperation. Furthermore, even if the protection seems to operate correctly, there could be problems that would go unnoticed if an after-the-fact analysis is not conducted. Here's an example that shows why every fault on the system should be investigated. In this simplified one-line diagram, a high-voltage 500 kV transmission system is connected to a 161 kV sub-transmission system through substation X. The YY transformer is equipped with CTs in the grounded neutral leads on both the high voltage and low voltage sides. The CT secondaries are then connected in parallel so as to monitor the total ground fault current from both the 500 kV and 161 kV systems. The current monitored by this CT arrangement is referred to as the station neutral ground current. A single line to ground fault occurred on C phase of one of the 161 kV lines leaving station X. These traces were recorded automatically by an oscillograph machine installed to capture fault information. Here we show the C phase current on the faulted line and the station neutral current. Just prior to the fault, normal load current flows in C phase of the line and the station neutral current is close to zero. When the fault occurs, both phase current and neutral current increase dramatically as we would expect. After about five cycles, breaker number one, protecting the faulted line, trips to clear the fault. There are about 30 cycles of line dead time before breaker number one recloses. Like most faults on overhead lines, this one was transient in nature. It was probably caused by insulator flashover from a lightning surge or perhaps high winds momentarily pushing a tree branch into the conductor. 30 cycles of dead time with no current flowing is usually sufficient to allow the fault arc to deionize. So when the breaker reclosed, it did not trip out again. You can see from the trace that breaker number one has successfully reclosed. So far, the line protection has operated exactly as we would expect. But take a look at the station neutral current. It is extremely distorted and became progressively worse during the five cycles that the fault was on. Distortion like this is a clear indication of CT saturation. In this case, the saturation is caused by the fact that the fault current is not symmetrical. There is much more negative magnitude than positive. This offset in the fault current is called DC offset, and it has the same effect as adding burden to a CT. The CT secondary output becomes distorted and no longer accurately reflects conditions on the system. Now, you'll remember we discussed this problem in PSP3, but you might say, if the protection worked okay, why should we worry? Well, the problem is that the same pair of CTs are also used to provide polarizing current for the directional relays on the line. This current is used as a reference to determine whether a particular fault is in the tripping 
or non-tripping direction. The direction of polarizing current is compared with the direction of current flow in the line. In this particular incident, the relays associated with breakers 2 and 3 on the 500 kV system registered the high current, but decided that the fault was in the non-trip direction. Carrier block signals were then sent to block tripping of the remote breakers. This is correct. The problem of CT saturation was noted on the fault analysis report for future consideration. Sure enough, a few months later, a similar fault occurred on the 161 kV system. But this time, the 500 kV breakers tripped incorrectly before the 161 kV breaker could clear the fault. Here are traces of the carrier signal that was transmitted from breaker number two during the fault and the C phase current seen by breaker two. About three cycles into the fault, interruptions or holes begin to appear in the carrier signal. The holes are due to the extreme distortion in the station neutral current that is, the reference current. How is this? Well, when the relays at breakers 2 and 3 compare the ground residual current with the distorted reference current, the phase relationship is unclear. The relays now mistakenly decide that the fault is in the trip direction and simultaneously suppress the carrier blocking signal. This allows the breakers on the 500 kV system to falsely trip for a fault on the 161 kV system. As before, this was a temporary fault, so all breakers reclosed successfully at high speed. The problem was solved by replacing the 161 kV neutral CT with one having better operating characteristics. There are two basic methods for gathering fault data, automatic and manual. Fault data is recorded automatically on oscillograph machines and sequence of events recorders. An oscillograph machine starts automatically when a fault occurs. It records waveforms of selected voltages, currents, and communication signals. On the other hand, a sequence of events recorder constantly monitors the status of control switches, breaker contacts, and relay contacts. Whenever a change in status occurs, the device number and the status change are printed out as a typewritten list. These automatic recording tools will be described in more detail in the next segment. Fault data can also be gathered manually. This is done by checking and logging the operation of protective relays. As you know, each relay is equipped with a brightly colored target or flag that tells us when the relay has indeed operated. Such relay actions are always logged for future reference and analysis. Indeed, on distribution systems, this is often the only information which will be available to assist analysis. Here is one example of a relay action log which reports upon failure of a lightning arrestor during a lightning storm. The failed arrestor was located on the low voltage side of a 115 to 69 kV auto transformer. The resulting fault within the transformer's zone of protection caused the differential relay to operate. This in turn tripped all three breakers, primary, secondary, and tertiary, to completely isolate the fault. The actual information logged includes the date and time of the relay action, the numbers of the breakers involved, the relay targets, the time each breaker was closed, and the number of the pertinent oscillograph recording. In this particular case, the investigator, using all of the data along with the oscillograph traces, decided that all relay and breaker actions were correct. This is noted on the form. Any misoperations would typically be reported on a separate log 
and a thorough investigation would follow. Of course, these relay action reporting procedures will vary from utility to utility, so you must be sure to check and learn your own company procedures. At this point, it's time for a break. In the next segment, we'll be looking at fault analysis tools in more detail. Until then, please switch off the videotape and review the written material in your workbook. Thank you.